Thank you, AAP, for having me at this exciting product theater. My presentation today is the scientific rationale and clinical applications for amnion chorion membrane, especially with bisphosphonate and immunocompromised patients. Today's learning objectives are simple, to review the ever-changing dynamics in the management of medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw, learn appropriate sequencing and treatment planning of the compromised patient, and also to apply new and relevant protocols and regenerative science utilized throughout the various surgical subspecialties. So here's the classic diabetic ulcer. For many of you that have seen me lecture, we've seen this time and time again. Here's the patient that was scheduled for an amputation. And we know the diabetic patient is prone to chronic infection and chronic inflammation. Here the wound was debrided an amnion chorion membrane was placed on days one and 14. And notice 10 days post debridement, what you have, a healing wound, a wound that's actually bleeding and less inflamed. And 42 days post-op, we now have a wound that's closed and a foot that is functional. The truth is this, we're dealing with issues of chronic inflammation, infection, and bacterial contamination. So in the end, the most important question we have to ask is, what product on your shelf can do this? And this is why I choose BioExclude. This is a product that's an amnion chorion membrane that is immunoprivileged, anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, has accelerated wound healing. And for many of you that have seen me lecture time and time again, I've always been a proponent of a product that's both a barrier and a carrier in one product. In other words, it's a membrane, and it also provides me with growth factors, something that is the essence of dental implantology and dental regeneration. In one of my lectures, I've shown how a simple extraction case of taking out a lateral incisor can show and magnify the beauty of how an amnion chorion membrane can optimize the healing. Here's a tooth that was extracted, grafted with FDBA, and notice my post-op extraction wound within 72 hours. With a PTFE suture, I have no inflammation and a wonderful layer of epithelium forming over the bioexclude that was placed. At suture removal, appreciate the thick, healthy pink tissue. And for re-entry of the implant, how about that, folks? In the anterior maxilla, in the aesthetic zone, my biggest issue right now is not if and whether I have enough bone tissue, but it's placing the implant at the optimal depth and placement. In other words, following prosthetics and surgery. And for those of you today that's using Strauman implants, you'll recognize that implant. That's an implant that is placed three millimeters apical to the adjacent CEJ. Because we know in the world of aesthetic dentistry, we want to place implants in the ideal position as possible. On the CAT scan, you'll notice after the extraction, I have graft containment. Many times when treating these patients, we do realize that we lose bone, we lose tissue. Utilizing an optimal combination of a 70-30 FDBA mix, concurrent with placement of a bioexclude membrane, I'm able to contain the graft and utilizing guided surgery, place a dental implant in optimal position. Again, here's a Strauman dental implant, and that's the famous loxum attachment with the one millimeter increments. Notice how this implant is placed deep to the bone. Why? I'm not placing the implant where the bone is, I'm placing the implant where it belongs. And this is the beauty of using amnion chorion because it really helps you maintain the regeneration that you're trying to do. Not only is this a product and the amnion chorion that has wonderful regenerative potential, but it has wonderful antibacterial potential. It's not uncommon if I'm doing an internal sinus lift, whether it's with an osteotome or a versibur, I occasionally get the perforation on a thin sinus membrane. And we all know that the maxillary sinus is full of bacteria, Haemophilus influenza, strep pneumonia. On these cases, it's never an issue. I simply place bioexclude as a patch, dry, and I place it very gently against the perforation. And you'll see by my photos that I continue placing my graft, which is FDBA. 
And I even use the VersaBur to help disperse the graft into the sinus cavitation that I'm doing for the internal sinus lift and the placement of a threaded implant. Appreciate the fact that on the post-op periapical, I have an implant that's placed and a beautiful shape domed, which tells me that the dome has contained my bone graft. So the truth is this, what other product do you have that's this versatile for implant dentistry? And of course, the maxillary sinus lift. Whether I'm doing an internal sinus lift or an open window, we all fall into the trap of, well, let's just say being very generous in our exposure. And every so often we do end up with a perforation. And for those of us surgeons out there that's dealing with open lateral windows, appreciate the fact that during a sinus perforation, don't fret. The placement of a 20 by 30 bio-exclude amnion chorion membrane dry, and here I'm using my bone plugger, very gently just placing it against the membrane and making sure that I'm five millimeters extended beyond the perforation and notice how easily it's placed. I am placing this product for the following reasons. It's easy to handle, it's antibacterial, it's anti-inflammatory, and I can continue my surgery and continue my regeneration with the confidence that I need to do these cases. But the truth is this, folks. We're dealing with a different subset of patients these days. And one of the biggest problems, according to the American Association of Oral Surgeons and their position paper by Sal Ruggiero in 2014, was bisphosphonate osteonecrosis. And today, the new term is medication-induced osteonecrosis of the jaw. Why did they change that? Because they discovered now that there are more medications on the market that's being taken by patients that can cause the medication-induced osteonecrosis. The position paper by Dr. Ruggiero and the research by Dr. Marks has shown that the potential underlying mechanisms include, number one, the inhibition of osteoclastic bone resorption and its remodeling. Number two, and perhaps very important, is inflammation and infection. And add into, the, add into this little mix the inhibition of angiogenesis, and Dr. Ruggiero's position paper shows that this trifecta of mechanisms is a problem. But thank goodness we follow the literature. And since 2014, we've been able to go back and review the literature, what's out there. Here's a wonderful paper by Dr. Tang et al. in 2017 in the Journal of Biomaterials. And he started using human acellular amniotic membrane. And the aim of the current study was to investigate the osteoinduction and the angiogenesis. Remember, folks, this is about the research, past and present. So I'm going to tie in research from the past and the present to help us treat our patients in the future. What he has demonstrated, Dr. Tang, is the following, that the amniotic membrane has an excellent biocompatibility profile. It has bone marrow and mesenchymal cell, cell proliferation. It has osteogenic differentiation and improved bone regeneration. For those of you that want to look up the article in the Journal of Biomaterials 2017 by Dr. Tang, I think you'll find a very well-written article. Also in November 2017, the Journal of Biomaterials, once again, Dr. Tang, there was gene expression that was connected with cells recruitment and bone remodeling and it was enhanced in the defects implanted with human acellular amniotic membrane. So what is the conclusion that I can draw from Dr. Tang and his research? That the amniotic membrane is potentially osteoinductive biomaterial, it promotes the formation of blood vessels, and it has the potential and increases bone formation and bone remodeling. So, Let's consider the cranial maxillofacial surgery realm. We know that these people that work in the head and neck region doing facial and skull reconstruction, they are well endowed with the literature. And the truth is this, they realized the problem with osteomyelitis. And in the journal by Dr. Coase of cranial maxillofacial surgery, he mentioned that there's increased bacterial adhesion and a biofilm formation that promotes osteomyelitis and causes failure of dental implants or bisphosphonate-coated joint prosthesis. 
Imagine that the journal Cranial Maxillofacial Surgery is commenting on dental implants because the key word here is the biofilm formation. In other words, a bacterial insult that will cause inflammation, infection, and osteomyelitis, and then patients will eventually end up with osteonecrosis if they're taking a compromising type of medication. But remember guys, it's all about the bacteria. And thanks to the International Journal of Dentistry in 2019 by Dr. Ashraf, he showed about the antimicrobial activity of the amnion chorion membrane to oral microbes. And it was proven to be as bactericidal. I didn't say bacteriostatic, I said bactericidal, as paper discs inoculated with tetracycline. And notice the three bacteria that he was put, put, put Notice the three bacteria that he was focusing on, AA, strep mutans, and streptococcus oralis, common bacteria. In scientific reports of 2019 by Dr. Palanker, he also did his research, and his demonstrated that the complete elimination of bacterial cells on the amnion chorion membrane in three assays. And appreciate the three bacteria he targeted, strep mutans, strep gordoni, and porphomonas. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the bacteria that we're dealing with the periodontium. This is the, the, uh, this is the auditorium that these bacteria like to fester in and cause the problems of chronic periodontitis leading to the continuation of chronic inflammation. In the Journal of Surgery Research in 2015, Dr. Mann also shows cell recruitment by amnion chorion and promotes neovascularization. We know that the human amniotic membrane has demonstrated an efficacy in promoting wound healing. But however, notice the last several words. The underlying mechanisms remain unknown. Just as we do not know all the facts about medication-induced osteonecrosis of the jaw, we also do not know all the positive attributes that the amniotic, membrane, the amniotic membrane will show us. But I can promise you that with time, we're going to be very impressed with the amnion chorion membrane. And why is it that? And why is it being used by many subspecialties to treat chronic cutaneous wounds? Simple. Number one, low immunogenicity. Number two, it reduces inflammation and pain. Number three, it accelerates wound healing. Number four, it promotes fibroblasts and endothelial cell proliferation. AAP, I would like you to appreciate the second comment I made, reduces inflammation and pain. This is the world that we live in, chronic bacteria causing chronic problems, causing chronic inflammation. That is the foundation of periodontology. That is the foundation of wound and its infections. This is where we can use an amnion chorion membrane to our benefits. Cell recruitment by amnion chorion promotes neovascularization. This has been well documented by Dr. Mann in the Journal of Surgery Research in 2015. And it shows that in addition to angiogenic and trophic effects exerted by an amnion chorion membrane, that there's a modulation of the immune response to it, and it plays a role. It helps in the remodeling phases. What I'm doing here is bringing in the research from the past and the present and tying into the fact that amnion chorion is a very powerful tool that should be considered for our patients that's dealing with chronic inflammation and chronic infections. So the conclusions that I'm drawing right now about amnion chorion is that number one, it's a biologically active scaffold. Number two, it can recruit progenitor cells to a wound. And number three, it promotes angiogenesis, well-documented in the literature, supported by many subspecialties. Did you know that the amnion chorion membrane is simply saturated with cytokines and growth factors? Last time I gave a lecture, I was very proud to mention there was over 256 different growth factors. To date, we're we're counting over 285 growth factors, and that number is probably still growing with time. And notice the key growth factors to the right, PDGF, VEGF, EGF, TGF, angiopoietin, 
Appreciate the fact that this product has plenty of growth factors that's working for us and for the patient when used properly in therapies. The androgenic properties of amnion chorea membranes should not be discounted. It contains many angiogenic growth factors. But perhaps the last line at the bottom of this slide by Dr. Kube mentioned that the amnion chorion grafts are a promising wound care therapy with the potential to promote revascularization and tissue healing within poorly vascularized non-healing wounds. Does that sound like chronic perio to you? I think so. Again, AAP, something to strongly consider. So here I am reviewing all the literature and I decided to take a look at some case reports. And here's a journal of surgical case reports from 2018 where Dr. Regazzo showed a wonderful set of cases where he used the amniotic membranes to treat patients with active bisphosphonate osteonecrosis of the jaw. And these were followed for a period of a half a year. And these were patients that had documented cases of bisphos osteonecrosis. And he decided to do a surgical flap skeletonize the entire wound, debride the necrotic bone, place an amnion chorion membrane, suture it, and follow it. These patients were followed up for 180 days to the point that the patients became asymptomatic and no further abscesses had developed. The protocol that Dr. Regazzo followed included the following. Number one, bisphosphonates are discontinued for two months prior to his procedure. Number two, and I want you to remember this, extensive fistulectomy. Number three, skeletonization and exposure of abundant necrotic tissue. Number four, depridement of the hyperplastic inflamed tissue and the removal of the necrotic bone. And then finally at the bottom, the positioning of a cryopreserved human amniotic membrane. I appreciate the fact that Dr. Regazzo on steps two and three, which include extensive fistulectomy and skeletonization and exposure of abundant necrotic tissue, he pretty much opened the surgical site up. Whereas in modern day oral surgery and periodontology, we're taught to treat these patients as conservative as possible and minimize the reflection of the flap. His final discussion said that the application of the amniotic membrane can be viewed as a promising therapeutic alternative for patients with bisphosphonate osteonecrosis. Perhaps we don't need a need for HBO anymore. These are encouraging results and can provide a starting point for determining whether the application of amnion allografts can provide a promising therapeutic alternative. Notice what he said, folks. Dr. Regazzo said this is a starting point. So we have to use the knowledge and what's in front of us. So I've decided to use it as a starting point. And for now, for further discussion, we've now established that amnion chorion could be a promising treatment for the medication osteonecrosis of the jaw. But ideally, at least in my practice, we don't want to treat bisphosphonate osteonecrosis. I want to prevent it. I already have plenty of cases of bisphos or medication-induced osteonecrosis, but how about for the common patient that's still coming in, I'm trying to prevent these problems. I don't want to send them to the hospital. So what if I could use all the same rationale and case successes for treating confirmed medication-induced osteonecrosis and spin it around and use it for prevention? So I'm going to show a series of my cases and have a nice discussion about this. This is a 55-year-old female patient. She presents with autoimmune disorders, taking methotrexate, which I think is a very common drug. She comes in and referred by her general dentist who sends over a periapical. Evaluate number 19, talk to the patient about an extraction and an implant. Well, in today's day and age, patients sometimes just don't want to hear things. She declined socket preservation. She declined grafting. She declined a dental implant. All she wanted to do was have the tooth taken out. Why? It was bothering her. The insurance didn't cover A, B, C, or X, Y, Z. Fine, I said. This is my practice. I have a practice that's very busy with teeth, titanium, and these types of issues, especially medically compromised individuals. But notice this patient is not me that medically compromised. It's just a patient on methotrexate, right? Just an antibiotic. The patient ended up returning to me three weeks later with delayed healing 
and a deep pain in the bone. So what is methotrexate? It's in a class of medications called an antimetabolite, and it treats cancer by slowing the growth of cancer cells. It's also used to treat leukemia, rheumatoid arthritis, and severe psoriasis. Ladies and gentlemen, plenty of your patients will take this medication. And you have to read through uh, paragraphs upon paragraphs of complications until you reach the very last sentence on the bottom, that there's an increased risk of soft tissue necrosis and osteonecrosis. Notice how they very sparingly or minimally mention osteonecrosis. But this is the theater and the arena that we're dealing with right now with these patients that's coming in because often they're coming in on methotrexate, steroids, and a whole host of other medications, if not medical problems. Here's a curveball, folks. Why use amnion chorion membrane as a nerve wrap? Now you're probably saying, Tony, why are you mentioning this in the middle of a presentation about the patient that's dealing with a medication-induced osteonecrosis? I'll tell you why, because these are the patients that I see. Here's an atrophic mandible that showed up one day to my practice, was worked up for a full arch reconstruction. I had no concept in my mind that I wanted to do bone grafting on this patient. I ended up doing a, a mandibular all on four. She's a cancer survivor. And when, while doing her full arch, I did a mental nerve lateralization. And in this case, all I did was place a tilted implant in the posterior aspect in that island of bone, placed a multi-unit abutment, and prepared for my surgical conversion for the prosthesis. But here, I like to use an amnion chorion membrane to either protect the mental nerve, protect any branches of the mental nerve, and even protect the soft tissue from that multi-unit abutment you see on the right-hand side. Now, you're probably asking, why am I showing you this? I'll get to the point in a second. I also like to use amnion chorion membranes when I take out deeply impacted wisdom teeth, especially when they're very intimate with the inferior alveolar nerve or has an associated cyst and I expect a paresthesia. I'm not a big fan of partial odontectomies. I tend to remove the entire tooth and I tend to lay a layer of amnion chorion over the exposed inferior alveolar nerve. And the reason why I do so, once again, is because it's supported by the literature, not just by the dental literature, but by the plastic surgery literature that routinely use amniotic membranes to cover facial nerve repairs and do reanastomoses. And it's well documented that it shows better soft tissue healing, a milder inflammatory reaction, and a more satisfactory nerve conduction result postoperatively. So, Again, folks, you're asking me, all right, Tony, you like to use amnion chorion around a nerve. Why? Because on these patients that show up with these lytic lesions, for example, a last patient three weeks later, I now have a lytic lesion in the mandible as shown by a CT scan. Yes, surgical pearl, folks. If your referring dentist sends you a periapical on a patient that's medically compromised, do yourself a favor and take a pre-op either cone beam or a panoramic film as a baseline. I am sharing my experiences with you. I wish I had a pre-op cone beam or a pre-op panoramic film. I don't know when these cases are gonna pop up, but what I have here is a lytic lesion. I have a lesion that's growing, and at the lower left side, you'll notice that I have a thin lingual plate, and this lytic lesion is, start, is starting to approach the inferior alveolar nerve. No paresthesia yet on this patient. I decided to place an amnion chorion membrane because of its angiogenic properties and to protect the inferior alveolar nerve. All I did was saturate a 15 by 25 sheet of bioexclude for two minutes in sterile saline and placed it in the bottom of this lytic lesion after I gently debrided it, made sure not to curatage the nerve by accident. I did not bone graft the ridge. The reason why is I'm not doing preservation here, folks. I'm trying to minimize the inflammatory process. I'm trying to stop the, the start of potentially a medication-induced osteonecrosis, and I'm trying to protect the nerve. I achieved some degree of closure. It wasn't primary closure. And on the CT scan, I want you to appreciate the following fact. You see the lytic lesion on the right-hand side that's approaching the inferior alveolar nerve, 
But look at the opposite side, opposite side of the mandible. You see that root canal that, that was done? You see that black hole at the bottom of the apex of that tooth? That to me almost substantiates the reason that this is all a bacterial inoculation. Perhaps this patient will have a future concern on the lower right side in the future. To me, it's all about the bacteria. So three weeks post extraction, I have a patient now with a lytic lesion that's starting to erode the lingual plate of the mandible. It's starting to basically thin the jaw, attach, attack the marrow space, and become an area of concern. All of this over a simple extraction. Four months after the extraction, meaning that the patient came back three weeks later with, with a, a deep toothache, I placed the bioexclude, I sutured it in there, I placed her on antibiotics. Look what I have here four months post extraction. I don't have a lytic lesion that's infesting my mandible, it's going away. Did I actually prevent a medication induced osteonecrosis? Perhaps. I did, a, so I did a post op CT scan. I am seeing some degree of bone fill. I am seeing bone remodeling. I'm seeing an intact lingual plate. I have no paresthesia. I'm getting a good degree of bone fill. The soft tissue that you can see right there is appreciative. But I want you to notice one small detail. Remember, Dr. Regazzo, point number two and point number three? Make sure that all your fistulas are removed. If you take a look at the alveolar mucosa, there are some little white dots. That, my friends, are those little fistulas. Those fistulas tracks are little bacterial hints. They're hinting at you that something could be inside the jaw. So what I decided to do was re-enter the surgical site. The reason why is the patient has fistula. And here, after laying a full thickness flap with a crestal incision and dissecting slightly to the lingual and slightly to the buccal, these are the fistulous tracts that I am pulling out from the soft tissue that goes into the jawbone. And all I did was do a very gentle corticotomy, remove any osteoid or any quote unquote weak looking areas of bone fill. And I decided to graft the area. I grafted the area with a 70-30 min demineralized mix of freeze-dried bone. I like to use cortical bone. And I placed a 20 by 30 sheet of amnion chorion over the entire lesion. That's my, that's my suture uh, removal visit two weeks later. I have pink tissue. I have no fistulous tracts. I have a fair amount of primary closure. Those sutures are polypropylene. For these type of surgical cases, I either use a PTFE suture or a polypropylene suture. I'm a Yankee fan. I like to use blue sutures. What can I tell you, folks? But nonetheless, right now, I'll have the patient back soon after our little uh, New York pandemic uh, simmers down, and I plan on doing some follow-up CTs and seeing the quality of the bone that regenerates. Another patient during the pandemic presents a 54-year-old male patient with a vitamin D deficiency, anemia, hypertension, heart disease, aneurysm, a type 2 diabetic, and severe osteoporosis. Oh, by the way, he takes intravenous bisphosphonates for 10 years, Zomedia. And we know about IV Zomeda. Zoledronic acid is well documented in the literature. Thank you to Dr. Ruggiero, as well as to Dr. Marks. It's used to treat symptoms of cancer. It's used to treat hypercalcemia. It's also used to decrease fractures from secondary to osteoporosis. And if you take a look at the second paragraph, the last sentence in the second paragraph, invasive dental procedures should be avoided during treatment. That's basically it, folks. That second paragraph mentions that the osteonecrosis of the jaw has been, has been reported rarely in patients. I tend to disagree. Intravenous somatia should be appreciated. And these are the patients that we get to see in our patients in our patient pool every day. So I basically called the primary care physician, just like Dr. Vergazzo did. And according to the primary care physician, she wanted me to stop the Zomeda only for three weeks. I don't argue. I simply agree and I document it. I discontinued his aspirin for one week before his surgery. 
The reason why I have this CT scan up is for the appreciation for the AAP. Because even though this patient is existing with what he calls to be a sound and stable dentition, he has multiple pockets of chronic localized periodontitis. This patient, to be quite honest with you, is living in a condition of low-grade chronic inflammation. I would like to think that most periodontists and surgeons would agree with me. However, the patient's happy. He has his teeth. His dentist is maintaining everything. So I'm thinking to myself, uh-oh, if I have to take out this tooth, I expect poor bone wound healing. Why? Because the rest of the mouth is telling me so. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a simple case, and it's a standard case. It's a fractured molar. The tooth is very gently removed. I have no problems in my protocol in laying back a surgical flap. My surgical flap is about three to four millimeters of exposing the bone on the buckle as well as the lingual. I am no longer afraid to expose these patients. My protocol is simple. Debride, debride, debride. Cure it. Curatage, 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 irrigate, irrigate, irrigate. I will then very gently pack a 70-30 mineralized, demineralized cortical bone graft. Again, this is my workhorse. This is what I use. I'll place it up to the top of the crest. And then I'll very gently place an amnion chorion bio membrane. A 15 by 20 is placed. And I'll fold it over once. Why not? More like a double packing, if you will. I get my closure utilizing a 4-0 polypropylene. Again, just my suture of choice for the posterior. Primary closure, you can't always get it, but am I concerned? Eh, not really. For many of you that have seen me lecture time and time again, I've done a lot of complicated cases where I've left this membrane exposed to the oral cavity. And if you follow the protocol and how to use and how to manage an amnion chorion membrane, your results will become predictable. So ladies and gentlemen, IV Zomeda, the tooth is extracted. Four months post extraction, I decide to do a cone beam. I just wanna see the quality of the bone. I have a graft that's contained, the lingual plate is intact, good bone density, and look at that soft tissue. I'm, I'm, I'm smiling, I don't see any fistula. That's healthy, thick, keratinized tissue. All I did was go back to my cone beam. I decided to plan for a dental implant. I like to play with the HU, the Hounsfield units, just to get an idea of bone quality. And that's all it is, folks. The HU on these CT machines just gives you an idea of the quality. Nothing beats the tactile sense. Again, just my personal opinion. On the day of surgery, I decided to place an implant. Yes, I placed an implant on a patient that takes intravenous zomata. Why? Because he's demonstrated to me that he was able to heal. And number two, and forgive me for saying this, I think this part of his jaw is the best part of his jaw, the bone that I regenerated. So I laid back a surgical flap, not too generous, but enough to see the ridge. You'll notice that when I laid back the flap, you don't have that red granulomatous type remnants of, of membranes from, from days past. That's nice bone that's looking right at you. I create my osteotomy. I have bleeding bone in the osteotomy site. I placed a dental implant uh, with a minimum of 50 Newton centimeter torque. It is platform shifted. I even placed a healing cap. I had the patient come back three months later, took a periapical, bone level looks intact to me. I took off the healing cap. That is beautiful tissue on a patient that has a high risk periodontal status followed by a history of intravenous zomata. Look at that gingival sulcus on the lower right side. I contend that this tooth is probably going to be the best tooth in this mouth. So if I'm able to reconstruct and use regenerative therapies on this type of client, I become pretty confident in about managing, A, the patient that, pres that presents with these complicated type medical histories, especially with patients that present with medications that can cause problems. And honestly, patients that have chronic perio issues will probably benefit by the regeneration and the regener regenerative qualities that's often found in the amnion chorion membrane. But of course, during a pandemic, I can never get off easy. 
Here's a 79 year old female patient that shows up with trauma to the face. Fraction number eight. Hypertension, bilateral breast cancer, left knee replacement, right kidney cancer, spinal fusion, osteoporosis, takes aspirin, vitamin D, calcium, and prolia. Notice how I'm touching upon the medications that we're going to see over and over again. The methotrexate, the zomeda, and the prolia. I want you to appreciate these facts. Prolia is a rather unique medication. It is the first FDA approved rank ligand inhibitor. This is a very powerful medication that's given to women with osteoporosis at high risk for fracture. Remember, she's a trauma patient. The patient fell in the bathroom. She almost broke her hip, but she traumatized the anterior maxilla. Prolia is not without complications. It moves to the top of the list on the complication list osteonecrosis of the jaw because it suppresses the bone turnover and you can get some very serious skin infections. So here's what happens. And as you know, in the world of surgery, nothing ever goes routine. I call the primary care physician. I mentioned the patient fell, needs to have a tooth extracted. I was told absolutely not, do not remove the tooth. The patient just had an infusion three weeks ago. I have a patient with a horizontal root fracture. So what to do? I went back to the very simple principles of surgery. I isolated the anterior maxilla with an Eric arch bar. Basically, I splinted her teeth. You could use anything that you want. I was told we had to wait six months before we did any type of intervention. I didn't do any endo. I just maintained the status quo. Patient returns four months later with severe discomfort and an inability to bite. You know something? Made a decision with the primary care physician. We have to go in. Tooth number eight was extracted. It was grafted once again by 7030 FDBA. That's all that I use. And an amnion chorion membrane over the extraction site. Five months post extraction, patient comes back in and I'm doing a post op CT scan. Now remember folks, I'm not on my case is going to show you step by step by step of how to take out a tooth, placing the membrane and what have you. Cause this is, this is the run of the mill of my day. I don't document every single step or every single case. I just take pictures and highlights of certain cases that simply show up. Here's a case now, five months post extractions on prolia. What do I see? A nice gingival contour maybe some fracture lines all along the incisal edges of the adjacent teeth, but take a look at the bone contour and the bony envelope. It's been preserved. It's been maintained. I would argue that a periosteal uh, envelope is on the buccal aspect, for lack of better words. Pre-op. Pre-op, the patient was unable to bite down because the bite was edge to edge because of the avulsion of tooth number eight. I had an apex that was compromised outside of the bone envelope. I had no buccal plate. I had a horizontal root fracture, perhaps, and the patient was unable to bite down. I stabilized the situation at hand, and I decided, you know something? Let's graft it when we were able to get the medical clearance and maintain what we have. I was hoping that the prosthodontist would like to do a three-unit bridge or a four unit bridge. I figured, you know, these guys would love to do some crown and bridge and aesthetic work. And of course, the patient along in consultation with the prosthodontist were not comfortable in treating the adjacent teeth because they were A, asymptomatic, B, did not respond to, uh, they did respond to vitality tests, but the patient did not want to do any endo and she wanted to do something as least invasive as possible. She opted due to the advice of her prosthodontist to do a dental implant. I could say no, but I said yes. Why? Because she healed so well. Look at the qualities of using an amnion chorion membrane. Appreciate the fact that the bridge has been preserved. Appreciate the fact that on my re-entry, I had thick, healthy bone. So on my CT scan, I was working up the case once again. I was anterior to incisive canal. I had a good buccal contour. You know something? I can get a decent length implant. And notice another attribute. I am placing this implant three millimeters apical to the adjacent CEJ. Why? Because I'm following the prosthetic plan. 
The prosthetic plan is my surgical plan to place the implant in an ideal position as possible, which means three millimeters apical to the adjacent CEJ. Do you notice the fact that my implant is deep to the crestal bone? I see it right here. So on the day of surgery, I placed a three by three by 16 implant. I went for an extra long implant because I wanted to engage the nasal floor. Why? I want stability. The implant is placed at least two millimeters deep to the crestal bone. Again, I had too much bone in an area where I expected to have minimal bone. I literally had to place the implant at such a depth that I was deep to the crest of bone. For the, for the sake of aesthetics, I decided to regraft the buckle aspect with just a little touch of, of my 7030 FDBA bone, and I placed a small sheet of Amnion Corion. Um, that's a 12 by 12 sheet. The Biox boot comes in many, 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 many different sizes. Eight by eight is great for small little perforations, 12 by 12 for little buckle defects and socket preservations. The 15 by 20 is a wonderful workhorse, also used to patch the maxillary sinus on an open window. And the 20 by 30 for ridges and for large perforations of the maxillary sinus. Six months post implant placement, patient comes in for stage two. Appreciate the fact that my, that my little secondary graft, all I did was plump up the buccal tissue so it looks like number nine. So number eight will look like number nine. It's all about aesthetics. It's all about the bone setting the tone. Notice the implant we had a stage two done. That is a healing cap that is five millimeters high. Notice the fact that it is deep inside the bone which means I had enough bone that was maintained that the prosthodontist will have ample running room to create his final prosthesis. The amnion chorion membrane is a powerful tool, ladies and gentlemen. It's regenerative, it's immunoprivileged, it's anti-inflammatory, it's antibacterial. As a surgeon, this should be considered as part of your armamentarium. No matter whether you're doing small grafts, isolated grafts, large grief grafts, large regenerative procedures, PRF, PRP, ABC, this membrane, the bioexclude amnion chorion membrane, should be part of your armamentarium. You should appreciate the facts that it has wonderful growth factors, it has wonderful qualities, fantastic characteristics, well documented in the literature. And did I mention that this is perhaps the next step and the future of the use of amnion chorion and the fact that we're trying to avoid the medication-induced osteonecrosis of the jaw. I am Dr. Anthony Del Vecchio. I can be reached at JV Oral Surgery at AOL.com. That's my personal web, uh, excuse me, my personal email. I am a KOL for Snowasis Medical. I do routinely and still to this day use their products every day in my practice for my reconstruction, as well as my socket preservation and all my fine dental implant work. Um, I have multiple cases on Instagram at Del Vecchio Oral Surgery showing how I like to use the amnion chorion membrane and certainly reach out to me at your leisure. Once again, thank you AAP for having me and thank you Snowasis for the invitation to speak about a product that I am simply very passionate about. Thank you.